In the previous lecture file, we discussed the characteristics of bureaucracy that describe the federal executive branch today. But bureaucracy was not the first form of organization for the executive branch, but rather it evolved over time. This lecture file examines how the federal bureaucracy came to be and how it's changed in size over time. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to describe three periods of executive branch organization. The first period, from the 1780s to the 1830s, is sometimes referred to as an aristocratic system. Not literally aristocratic in the sense of having people with formal titles of nobility, but rather metaphorically in the sense that government service in this time was seen as a duty for a privileged few. There are relatively few federal government jobs at this time in the executive branch, and working for the government was seen as a sacrifice that well-off members of society were expected to make for a short period of time to help serve their new nation. Political leaders would usually tap into their own personal networks to help staff government positions. Uh, for instance, as depicted in the artwork on this slide, after President Jefferson completed the, the Louisiana Purchase, he called upon his personal secretary, Meriwether Lewis, to lead the expedition to explore the new territory that had just come into the possession of the United States. Lewis had no particular skills for this task, other than the fact that he was trusted by the president. Imagine that. One of President Jefferson's most daring and controversial actions as president, and he leaves it up to his personal secretary to lead the mission that the whole nation would be relying upon for information about the unknown lands of the West. Today, such an expedition would probably be coordinated by the U.S. Geological Survey, with assistance from the Army Corps of Engineers, scientists in the forests and park services, and linguists from any one of our many U.S. intelligence agencies. The idea is that personal connections and high standing in society were much more important determinants of executive branch service in this very early period of U.S. history than would be the case today. Eventually, the aristocratic system gave way to the spoil system. This form of organizing the executive branch was initiated by President Andrew Jackson. It was characterized by patronage, in which the president doled out jobs to party loyalists. The idea was to make the executive branch responsive to the president's preferences. As the head of the executive branch, the president expects to be able to direct federal agencies about how to carry out their missions. What better way to achieve that than by populating the executive branch with people who are loyal to the president? The only problem is that this system created a recipe for corruption and incompetence as it evolved into a racket in which people use government positions to line their own pockets and were not necessarily qualified to do the jobs they were hired to carry out. This system also became a significant drag on the day-to-day -day schedules of presidents. President's calendars became overrun by job seekers, taking time away from actually being able to govern the country. The problems of the spoil system came to a tragic head with the assassination of President James Garfield in 1881. Garfield was killed by a disgruntled job seeker, someone who had campaigned for Garfield in the election of 1880 and felt that he was owed a position in the federal government. When he failed to receive a job, he held it against the president personally and decided to kill him. This was finally enough to spur Congress into action and reform the organizational principles for the executive branch. Beginning with the Pendleton Act of 1883, the executive branch began to evolve into a bureaucratic form of organization in which government jobs were awarded on the basis of merit rather than party connection. This changed the nature of government work from something you do to cash in while your party's in power to a profession or occupation that you hold on the basis of technical skill, regardless of what political party happens to be in power. I want to finish our discussion of the evolution of the federal bureaucracy by looking at changes in the federal workforce over the last several decades. In the early part of the 20th century, the size of the federal workforce grew rapidly as government responded to the challenges of industrialization and the Great Depression. As this chart shows, the federal civilian workforce exploded during World War II, as many people on the home front were hired to help with the war effort. But since the war, 
federal civilian employment has been relatively flat, with civilian workers in the Defense Department declining since the end of the Cold War, and federal employees in all other departments increasing only slightly. This graph presents another way of looking at federal employment. Rather than raw numbers of employees, this chart depicts federal workers as a share of the overall workforce in the United States. Measured this way, the federal government has shrunk significantly as a source of employment in the overall economy, now accounting for about 2% of all workers. Just as when we considered the size of government early on in the semester, the picture painted by federal employment numbers is not one of massive government. That's not to say the federal government doesn't have extensive reach. For instance, by using things like grants and aid to encourage state and local governments to hire more people to carry out federal goals. But in terms of actual human resources, it's just not the case that the United States has an out-of-control bureaucracy.